One of the things that people have mentioned after his death was people were calling him the Tupac of this generation. I heard that within moments of him being killed. Mm. I mean, literally, I'd say within a half an hour, I'm looking online and, and people's like, yo, XXX was the Tupac of our generation. Like, you know. Mm -hmm. You can compare in certain ways. I mean, definitely as far as the the doom and gloom, the video right after your death, about your death, those are the things that I really compare right there. Um, I didn't know enough about his music to say, to compare him in those type of terms. Well, and his I mean, his music was really about depression. I was with my son when that whole news came across. So my son actually is the one that told me about it. And when like he heard the news, I could tell he was visibly shaken up by the shit. Kind of like how I probably was when I heard the news about Tupac. You understand what I'm saying? Like, like I seen it in his face that this was one of those artists that definitely touched his, his generation and this just wasn't any old rapper getting killed. Like, like he looked fucked yeah. up by it for a second. You did? Yeah. He, you know, like, for example, we, we had put up parts of the, the No Jumper interview with Tacion, which was his first ever interview. And he talked about, you know, I got to, you know, the first time I actually got to watch it was after after he had passed. And this was a troubled kid, you know, a lot of depression. Stabbed um, his mother's boyfriend when he was seven or yeah, some shit like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Grew up in a very, in a very rough uh, environment where his mom really couldn't take care of him the way a, a, you, sh you should take care of a small child. Mm. You know, uh, he was exposed to a lot of things early that he should not have been exposed to really ever. Right. Um, you know, went to jail for a lot of just kind of random robberies and break-ins and, and stuff like that. Got into a lot of fights. And some sort in of domestic prison. thing yeah. with his girl or something like that. Yeah, th yeah, then there was a whole thing with his girl where allegedly he beat her up really badly. That's actually why he was in jail when he first started to right. uh, blow up. Uh a lot of a lot of stuff that you could tell he was really conflicted being conflicted with and you know and although he wasn't actively beefing with people at the time that he passed early on he actually was beefing with a lot of people there were fights on stage yeah so for example when xxx did a show in san diego uh this artist named rob stone who we had interviewed as well uh earlier ended up jumping on stage and fighting him yeah i remember that yeah th th there there was a lot of inc you know i don't want to basically say oh this guy was a perfect angel and never right hurt anybody or never you know did anything bad he he had his share of troubles he was only 20 years old though. right but then i heard he was trying to change his life around even that shit i heard like with the drake video where he's giving away shit i heard that came from a challenge that this dude had or some shit like that he was 20 years old he was still trying to work shit out exactly At 20, i was i was doing a lot of dumb shit a lot of dumb <laughs> you know shit. a lot of a lot of dumb shit it's very sad but it just goes to show, you know, and and the same day this happened, Jimmy Wapo gets killed in Pittsburgh. Right. Who we had interviewed as well. Now, I never, I don't think I had heard of Jimmy Wapo, but when some, when my son again told me what song he said, I was like, oh, I know that song with the Kill Bill beat. Like, I kind of like that shit. Like, that was some catchy shit. Well... And and right when both of these murders happened, everyone started posting up that Boosie video that we did of rappers getting killed in their home city. It's crazy when you say most rappers get killed in their city. I started thinking Bankroll Fresh got killed in Atlanta, Chain Struggs got killed in Queens. We can go back who Soldier Slim killed in Louisiana, Big L killed in Harlem, the Biggie and Tupac thing. They were traveling at the time, but everybody else, oh, Jam Master J was killed in his own studio in Queens. Right, right. It's facts, man. It's not what I'm speaking is facts. You know, those are the guys, those are the guys who want to hurt you, those guys, those guys who've been looking at you your whole life and building up envy. They build up envy to where they can't do nothing now. They can't, they can't stop you from getting money. You don't want to be their friend or associate. You can't come in their crew and get any kind of money. They're, they're too big for you to even try to beef with. So you know what? I'll just take your life. And it just goes 
to show how deep the hate runs with people who you've known for a long time that don't achieve the level of success that you have. And it just reminds them over and over again. Yeah, well, it, it, I don't know if it's always that, though. You see, like, you got to understand, like, a lot of crime is all about convenience and proximity. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Like, y'all motherfuckers are flashing big cash in an area where motherfuckers don't necessarily have the cash. Now, it's not all about, oh, I'm hating on you. Listen, you have just become an easy lick. You have even now become an easy way for me to try to alleviate my fucking problems. And you are, you're right here. I don't have to go nowhere. I know my way around here. If I rob you, I know all the back streets and how to get back to my crib. If I have to go out to where the rich people live to rob them, that's 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 risky. So a lot of crime is is has to do with just proximity and 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 just being an opportunist at the time. Just like you said, yeah. the motherfuckers was at the motorcycle place, right? They might have yeah. not even planned to do no shit like that day. It might have just been a crime of opportunity. Yeah. Well, I mean, I interviewed Deal Hughley uh, the other day, and we talked about quote-unquote black-on-black crime. And we were saying how we talk about black-on-black -black crime, but the reality is is that people get killed in their neighborhoods, in sure. their vicinities. So if you live in a black neighborhood, you're, you'll probably get shot by a black person. If you live in a trailer home, you'll probably be shot by a white person. Let me ask you something. Ethnic cleansing is what? People of that region killing other people of that region, right? That's what happens. When you when you 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 kill the people you're around. Now they might not be the same religion, mm -hmm. but they they're your people. Right. They're in your ethnic group. If I did something, um, or if something happened to any member of my family, who would they talk to first? The members of my family. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because a lot of crime are committed between people who know each other. So how do we get this special designation that we're more inherently more evil, more different? It is a designation they need to give us. I think the most dangerous phrase I've ever seen is not nigger, it's black on black crime. Hmm. Why is that? Because that, that's a marching order. That means we got to be handled differently. Black people kill black. Black neighborhoods are not inherently more dangerous because they have black people in them. They're more dangerous because they have black poor people. Show me a safe poor neighborhood. Like, yeah, people hurt the ones that they love or they feel, you know what I mean, strongly or about. Just or just people take the path of least resistance. Right. You understand? So if it's easier to do it here amongst my people, then that's what the fuck I'm going to do. Why am I going to do it over there when it's so much harder to do it over there? I right. stick out over there. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Over here, I can blend in more easy with my own people. Yeah, well, listen, rest in peace, XXXTentacion, rest, rest in, in peace, peace uh, Jimmy Wapo. Uh, I tell everyone I interview, be safe. You know, once you reach a certain level, it doesn't matter where you think you're comfortable at. Have security with you, have real security with you, uh, be armed or have someone legally armed. Not to cut you off, but how about we rest in peace the... Thoughts and aura and language of doom and gloom, okay? And flip that, okay, to language about life and love and living. And guess what's mm. going to happen? There That's go. going to be the shit that comes to you. Because yeah. I'm going to be honest. In damn near 30 years of being in this industry, yo, we ain't never had no beef. Never had one time we got a beef with a sound man and, and we had to whoop his fucking ass. That was it. So when Grand Pooba left, there wasn't a bit of friction between the two camps? I'm talking about beef where niggas is pulling out knives and guns or, or, or niggas is getting punched in the face. You see what okay. I'm saying? Like, like we ain't never had beef with other rappers and all of this type of shit or, or go to certain cities and have problems with people. Why? Because we talking some positive shit. We mm -hmm. emote 
positivity. You don't want to fuck with people like that. Like, think about Farrakhan can go anywhere, basically, in the black community. Uh, he can go in anywhere the in the community. black community. Yeah, but- Yo, Farrakhan moves like the president, though. And Farrakhan not, ain't just hanging out. But what <laughs> I'm saying moves is, with, with serious security. Nobody wants to fuck with Farrakhan, uh, you know, as far as in the black community. Uh, you know, white people, of course, even though they're starting to even fuck with him. Because I was watching a big three basketball game, and Farrakhan was in the audience, and they put the camera on him. And this shit was on, like... ESPN or some shit like that. And, oh, Mr. Farrakhan in the crowd. I was like, whoa. <laughs> when, when did white people start acknowledging Farrakhan and shit? <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm just saying, like, like, you give off some positive shit, positive shit's going to happen. You're going to be able to move around with, with love. People's going, oh, man, I love y'all. Da, 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 da. It ain't going to be all this, shit, fuck them niggas. Like, because some people... Just draw that to them with their with their attitude and their aura. And I'm just saying, rest let that rest in peace. Change your fucking attitude and your life will change.